Okay, Nita, well, I wonder, um, let's go and get started. And first of all, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. You're here for a Board of Trustees meeting. We're very grateful of your work on behalf of our students and staff and faculty. Thank you so much. Um, we're here this afternoon, I almost said morning because we're inside a building, but we're here this afternoon to talk about your role and your thoughts on the Match and Florida Opportunity Scholars Program. And I wonder if we could start on a very personal note by having you talk about what education meant to you growing up, like your earliest years, okay. kind of the value your family, community put on education. My parents were Holocaust survivors, so they were not able to have a complete education in their lifetime. And so in my household, education was so valued and our parents expected us to do our schoolwork and to do well. And they couldn't help us as much as we might have needed help along the way, but we knew we just had to do it. And there wasn't a question about it because it meant so much and it meant opportunities um, for us in our futures. And my parents also insisted that we all go to college. And they had three daughters and somehow they put three daughters through college and every one of us became successful individuals. And I would say that I'm very, very passionate about education because of what it does. It opens doors, it opens opportunities, as long as you have access to it and as long as you can figure it out. So if you're not educated, you're not gonna understand nor will you know how to access every opportunity that's available. And to me, it, is the number one most important thing other than health and family. Family's first, but if you're not educated, you really don't even know how to access healthcare appropriately. And so those are two really important pieces that go hand in hand. In order to keep yourself in good condition and well, you've gotta be educated or you will not know where to turn. Um, to even take care of yourself. And I think those two things can allow you to be successful going forward in your life. Mm -hmm. Nita, as, as a young girl growing up, do you remember um, a teacher or an elder who had a, a special impact on you that you really admired or you learned a lot from? I had a teacher actually in um, the second grade, Miss Kaler was her name. And she was fabulous. And she just made sure we all learned really, really, really well. And then actually I'm thinking about it now at the sixth grade level, I had another one and her name was Lillian Walker. And what I love is I'm Jewish, she was Lebanese. It didn't matter. She was the most wonderful woman on earth. It's so funny how, you know, in our country, if we're with neighbors and friends and we speak to each other and communicate, we get along beautifully. And um, she really taught me the value of everything and why I needed to become a teacher. And we had a little program called Teachers of Tomorrow. And in those days, you couldn't, a girl could not be a patrol boy, okay, and manage the streets and the traffic, but we got to be Teachers of Tomorrow. So because of that program, I, I got the opportunity to work in classrooms, even if it was only 10 minutes to work with different age levels of children, to read to them, to take them back to their classrooms after lunch, to spend some time getting to know a touch of what it might be like if I became a teacher. And one of the best things happened, I went to my first ever NEA conference and there she was. And we were now colleagues, so we went from my being her student to being colleagues. And that she truly had, um, I would say, the biggest influence. And the other teacher I mentioned was second grade, and that she just gave me that great start. What does being a teacher mean to you? So I will say this. I taught school for over 10 years full time, but I worked my way through college working in an elementary school 20 hours a week. So education means everything. But what's amazing is I am a teacher. I've continued to be a teacher throughout my life because it's about educating people. When you communicate, you're teaching if you do it in the right manner. And so I use my opportunities where I get to speak to young people. I do a lot of speaking in the community in which I live, especially with college students at every level of college, in the business school, um, in the MBA program. There's a business scholars program I speak to every year. I'm getting ready to go speak in a leadership class. I'm always teaching, even with my own team at work, okay? I might be the CEO, but 
still my responsibility to communicate appropriately and I'm teaching them things, but they're also teaching me. So it's a two way street. But I believe I was, I was made to continue to teach all my life. And I, I think that's what teaching is all about, sharing things that help people move forward and get ahead. Nice. Thank you. Anita, do you remember when, uh, can you take us back th to the point when you first started learning and kind of getting involved in what was then known as the Opportunity Scholars Program? So I got involved in the Opportunity Scholars Program, I want to say about six or seven years ago, actually before I joined the board, I started attending foundation meetings and there, there was an Opportunity Scholars meeting going on, so they invited me to sit in. And so I did, and it was so valuable just to hear what was happening at this university because I'm really a first-generation scholar as well. So was my sister who before me came here as well. But we were five years apart, so we were never here at the same time. Um, but it was the same kind of thing, only I had no services and no people to mentor me or nurture me or help me get through it. I had to work the system. Um, and I think we're so lucky to see what we offer. And I've actually met a number of the Opportunity Scholars and I've sat in roundtable discussions with them. And I met a brother and a sister and they lived in one of the counties uh, towards the Panhandle part of Florida. And one was going back to teach and one was going to become another type of activist within his community. And it was so wonderful that they wanted to go back to their home and bring back what the knowledge they gained by being a part of this program to help others, to help others through education, to be able to have the same opportunity if they needed it. And then I met another one, and um, in New York I met a couple of scholars. We sat and we had dinner one evening with two or three of them, and one young man lost both of his parents, so he had been a foster child. He's a partner in a law firm in New York City. He is a black young man, and I was blown away by him. He was so impressive, just the fact that somehow he managed to keep himself going to even be able to get to the point that he could apply to become a match and opportunity scholar, okay? That to me was huge. And hearing them talk about how they walked out of undergraduate school with no debt, and that allowed them to, to make anything out of their lives to come because they could either try to get scholarships for graduate programs or they could work. They could work their way through grad school. And the fact that they didn't have to, to work to survive with the Opportunity Scholars Program, they were able to get through those undergraduate years. And I think the graduate percentage is very high. It's, I know it's well over 80% that graduate. And so I think that's wonderful. There's a great retention rate. It's in the 90s, in the 90th percentile somewhere. But the, just knowing how many of them survive and get through the years and, um, and then go on to be incredibly successful individuals. I just loved hearing their, their personal stories. And so that really connected me even more so to them. And I participated in one of their commencements. I got to hear them once we went virtual. I got to go to the commencement that they did. And again, they brought in past Opportunity Scholars and they were phenomenal. And so I think we should be incredibly proud because of the opportunity being created, Opportunity Scholars. That's exactly what it does. It gives people this chance for success and to become an amazing citizen in the world we live in. Anita, as, as a first generation college student yourself and as an educator, what is it about the Opportunity Scholars Program that, that works? I mean, you've talked to students who've matriculated and have been successful. What, did, what, what does the program do to help those first generation students become successful? both here and then later? Well, I think it gives them, again, the word opportunity comes to mind. So they get nurtured along the way and they have mentors. And so they meet individuals that can give them guidance. And teachers give people guidance, professors give guidance, but so do individuals that they may be connected to through this program. They're fed, they're given opportunities for housing and books, and they don't have to worry about the things any other young person might be worried about 
because um, they don't have a guiding light or someone to help them through the system. And so to me, when I think of the nurturing, the nurturing is a really important piece of it because they need to, to talk to someone. They need to know they have someone to turn to. Okay, I'm not sure what title they use for that person, if it is a mentor, but I love that. I've mentored young people in college in the past and I've been assigned um, a mentee and I'm still very close to one of my mentees from, um, she's three years out of college now and we still stay in touch almost daily actually. And, and so when you can be there to be that shoulder for someone to cry on or to ask for help, or to give them that guidance that they need, it really helps, it really helps them. So they have a way to get through. And I think they get opportunities to learn about different professions along the way from the people that they're with. And so the opportunity for them to go further, the counseling that they receive, the counseling is huge because they may not know where to turn when they get here. And um, I know as a parent, I, my husband and I would take our children and give them opportunities to shadow. We would ask them what were they interested in learning about. And they would tell us and we would make arrangements for them to go to that business and shadow someone working in that field. And we actually created a program where I live, um, allowing middle schoolers to go out and shadow people in the business community. And I mean, the difference that it makes to that young person, it gives them a chance to, to look at something and say, I don't wanna do that for life. And um, I have a child now, one of my kids loved marine biology, still loves marine biology, not as his job though, not for his occupation, um, not for his money-making occupation, but he's still engaged in it because he did enough programs along the way to know he loved the field, but he didn't want to work in that field. And he actually serves on one of the IFAS boards, didn't attend Florida, but because I'm here, he met some of the people that are involved um, at Cedar Key in some of the work that's going on. And so that made him join that board and want to be a part of it. But that's what we offer these kids. We offer them the different opportunities and the chances to see all the possibilities. And what I love is in undergrad, they can make those kinds of decisions and help get help to determine how do I go forward? How do I take it to graduation and then make the leap into either graduate school or life? And I think that's really important for them to have someone who can help them see how to do these things in their lives. Exactly. Anita, I wonder, I mean, as, as a teacher and educator and, and also a first generation college student, you do not take education for granted. But I feel sometimes in this society, people who come from maybe more privileged backgrounds kind of take it for granted. Well, I'm going to go to college. My kids are going to go to college. How do you explain the match in Florida Opportunity Scholars to someone who may be a little more privileged and may not have thought as much about it. How, how do you sell the program to people like that? Well, I think it's important to help them understand where these students come from and the, the lives that they're living in. So you have to be honest with them and you have to help them to understand that they come from families who had almost nothing in the scheme of things, okay? But their parents valued education because they did do well in school. But at the same time, when I think about it, I think about the cost, the basic cost that it would take for someone like me to make a gift that could help even one person. So if we can do it that way and break it into little bites and bite-sized pieces, we can help a person who is a little more privileged understand that this person, that person won't have the opportunities that you've had unless we help them. And it doesn't take a lot to um, to create that help and so that's how i like to view things try to find the bite-sized pieces to help a person understand that basically the basics we can do for ten thousand dollars it takes a lot more than that in the long run to educate a young person here but at the same time if we can get people to consider that type of gift it has a huge impact and it can truly change a life and and then we work to get you know, more gifts like that. And, um, and what I love now is that we're trying to grow the program and add more young people and give more opportunities because there's so many people that have great needs. And right now in particular, we're living through the strangest time and I would say in probably all of our lives, unless we're maybe much older, 
we, we wouldn't have experienced what we've experienced this past year. And I, I'm hoping that those who come out of this in a good way will think about those who, who have issues because their family worked in hospitality or they worked in an industry that was clobbered. I mean, I, one of my industries got clobbered. Uh, I have an aerospace company and, you know, until people truly start flying again and uh, the company we make parts for starts selling airplanes again, we sell to many companies, but until that moment happens, we've been hurt dramatically and drastically and a lot of people don't even understand that. So there's so many people who already didn't make great earnings. Um, and, and truly, Florida is a, a state with a lot of tourism. So the, the hurt on everyone in that economy, that piece of the economy, that's a huge economic arm of this state. Think of the number of people that were laid off. I think of people I know who own large hotels in the state of Florida. I mean, they had to lay off hundreds and thousands of people. Think of Disney World, think of Universal Studios. Okay, so they I don't know what kind of money the people made that work there, but if they're working in a concession or in a restaurant, they're not making a fortune. Um, and I want their children to be able to have opportunity. I want those kids to be able to come because they need their lives to be different. They need to know that they can do so many other things, even if it's becoming a doctor, if it's becoming an attorney, whatever it might be, they have a chance. They have a chance in this university to learn about artificial intelligence and, and put it into any major they choose. They can become hybrid. I call them hybrid students. You know, and that's what we have to create today. We have to create students that are going to walk out of here and understand the content areas, okay, of what they're trying to learn. If it's science, then understand that science and have that knowledge, but also have the ability to use data, to understand that data and, and read it and figure it out and analyze it. And then also to have the ability to be visionary while at the same time having the abilities to communicate, to do critical thinking, to have these amazing soft skills that we don't often talk about all the time. And that's what our students need to look like today. They need to be offered all of the pieces of this new puzzle that allows us to create hybrid students in any field. It can be in the arts, it can be in engineering, it can be in medicine, and it can be in business. It can be in any of those fields. And so I think this is a time that we really want to educate young people because really the world is open to them as long as they're open to the education that it will take to get them there. Right. I need to just uh, kind of moving towards wrapping up. I wanted to give uh, Arturo a chance to ask a question sure. to you also. Um, but what is your vision for the Match in Florida Opportunity Scholars, say five or 10 years into the future? Wow. Well, hmm. So right now, we have about 350 students a year that we're able to award these scholarships to. And so when you think about it, we have quite a number of young people in this school, but I'd love to double it. I would love to see us double that number so that we give more people the ability and the chance for success. And if we can do that, it's going to take, you know, philanthropic uh, giving. It's gonna take us coming up with the way to share the stories, but all you have to do is put one of those young people on the stage to showcase their life and what they've been through and where they've come. And I really think the story, it sells itself. But I wanna see us double the number. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, well, first off, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to ask you Absolutely. questions. And. Um, you said that you were a first generation student and here at the University of Florida, of all places, would you be able to share your experience about what it was like to fight the system, as you said, uh, in your time? Well, in my time, I actually did something different. I skipped my senior year in high school and I didn't come straight into Florida, but I went straight into Santa Fe. Okay, and I got dual credit. So I got my high school diploma at the end of that year of being successful at Santa Fe. And then I got married. <laughs> and then I came to University of Florida. So a lot of things happened in my life when I was very young. Um, but 
yes, it was a real change. Even from Santa Fe was small in those days. It was very small. I only went to one building. And, um, but I had this program I got to participate in because my parents didn't have a lot of money. And so I worked as a teacher's aide and I worked 20 hours a week in the schools. And then I had requirements I had to take there, but requirements that also went with that teacher's aid program. So I worked with children all four years, 20 hours a week. And I worked under teachers the entire time that I, um, well, as I was a student there, and even as I transitioned into the University of Florida, and luckily I got in, I didn't have any issues getting in, and I did have a husband, so that helped, because he had already um, gotten his bachelor's when I started, and he was finishing a master's program, um, but I mean, I worked. So for me, I worked the 20 hour job and then we were very entrepreneurial. And so we also had a restaurant down the, the building still down the street on university. And um, so it's neat to see that building. Sadly, the restaurant that was there closed during COVID. Um, but it's still neat to think about all the things we did and we managed to be successful students. And then once I got to Florida, I knew exactly what I was gonna do because I was majoring in education. And um, once I got to that point, it was easier. It was when I had to take courses outside because I also minored in history. So I had to make sure I could get those courses I wanted in the history department and, um, and still be able to figure out the 20 hours a week I worked, um, plus afternoon going to cook food in this, for this restaurant that we never were in when it was open because it only served lunch. So we would meet up like five o'clock in the afternoon, prepare stuff and leave to go do either homework or classes at night. Um, and that's my life. I've just been a busy person my entire life. And so COVID forced me to sit still. This has been an interesting year of uh, not doing everything I love to do and want to do and could do. But, you know, Zoom, okay, I had to learn how to use Zoom. I had to learn how to use Teams. It changed me technologically and made me learn 10 times more than I already had learned at this phase of my life. But, but I still wouldn't be where I am today without all of the things I went through at UF. I had to stop working in the school, in the public school that I was in. And I, all my years, I was at Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings Elementary School. Um, and I had to stop the year that I did my student teaching. Okay, because that was full time. And so I had to be able to do student teaching. And, um, and then they hired me back as a part time teacher, even though I didn't have my degree yet. I had to finish my degree in August. But um, so it was a great experience for me here. And the education program then was just so, how do I say this? You knew exactly what you had to do. Every semester you had to take these courses. And it was pretty set in terms of what you had to do. The key was you just had to make sure you did it right. And, um, and so basically I finished college in three years because I did everything fast, including the, um, the time at Santa Fe and I got my Associate of Arts and then came here and I, worked, I did school and college and courses every summer um, and really worked hard because I knew I wanted to finish. And, um, and then unfortunately I couldn't get a job in Gainesville so we had to move, and I was really sad, but at least my husband had finished his degree as well. And then he started in his field, and I started in my field in Palatka, Florida, a very small place. So. Well, it sounds like, like you said, you had a very busy schedule at that time, <laughs> and for all of the decades afterwards. There is sometimes a narrative that is thrown around that if you were to you know, pay for someone schooling that maybe they would get lazy. They wouldn't have to have that experience of working through college. They would not do anything with that extra free time. And hmm. you've worked with a lot of students and I've also interviewed other students. So what is your perspective on that? Do you think that's true or fair or, or not at all? I think it depends on the person. Okay, having raised three kids who went to college and fit, each one finished in four years, um, they all had jobs along the way. They didn't have to, they chose to. And that was the best part that they chose to. My youngest was very active in sports, but he didn't want to try to be on a sports team because he said, I just want to be a fan. But he, re he refereed um, intramurals and he got paid 
to ref intramurals. And then he wanted to, when he was finished, he decided he wanted to work his way through businesses he had an interest in. So he worked in um, a restaurant that was a fast casual restaurant. He thought after college, that's what I want to do, open a fast casual restaurant. Um, so he learned a lot. He learned the industry and, um, and then he went on and, and did that and failed. <laughs> It wasn't his fault that he failed. He failed because of another company that opened a restaurant that became pay what you can. Mm. Okay. And um, because of that restaurant, four restaurants failed in the neighborhood where he opened. And so he learned lessons and he learned he never wanted to be in that industry. And so he's not. Um, but lessons and failures are important in life, okay? And then my, um, my oldest son went to Georgia Tech, and it's a school where you can co-op. He chose not to co-op, however, he said, if I get a job, how do you feel if I take a semester off? And we were fine, so he worked for Nortel Systems, actually for six months, and still graduated on time, okay? And probably took summer courses and whatever, you know, he managed it and he did really well. So he knew what kind of industries he wanted to go in. But all my kids um, also had jobs during high school. They didn't have to, they chose to again. We encouraged it because we wanted them to learn to be responsible people and not responsible just to us, responsible to others. And so I can tell you that I have three great kids. Okay, were they lucky? Yes, they were lucky. But they also worked, and um, and today they are all really doing well on their own. They're all entrepreneurs. It's very interesting in um, very different fields. Um, I do work directly with my oldest son, however. When my husband passed away, he and I um, had to take over our company, and very soon he will run it, and I will begin to step away. So it's really great when you, you know, you see what your kids have done because they were extremely well educated. Um, from the moment they entered school, uh, they took advantage. And then one of them got an MBA. The others didn't go to grad school, but he chose to. And it served him really well. He took it very seriously because he knew he was going to be in business. And so it's been great for him. And, you know, for our opportunity scholars, as long as someone helps and guides them, they're going to have the same hunger, I hope, to want to learn, to want to be successful because they can see what's out there. They're given the opportunities to see that um, there are ways that they can get ahead. And, um, and so do I believe in letting a kid just come and do nothing? Not really. I would love to see them, if nothing else, at least be involved in community service when you come to a university or a college because I truly believe in also doing community service. And through community service, sometimes you might learn that that's actually a career you might want to choose to go into. And, and so I, I don't like the thought of them just lazing their lives away and being very lazy and not finishing on time. So I'm kind of, my husband and I were pretty tough about that. And, uh, and then my husband passed away when my youngest son was in his junior year. And the one thing he kept telling my son, I want you to finish. So when we knew he had to come home for 10 days, I had to call the dean of students. And that dean said, if you need me, call me. Well, I stayed on the phone till the dean actually came to the phone uh, and waited for him. I said, this is what you said. I remember it from orientation, and this is three years later. And I want your help now for my child because he was in a program where if you miss a semester, you had to start over because he was in a business program and in that university, Every semester had set courses that you had to take. And um, if he missed this part, it really would have caused havoc for him and would have put him a year behind. And, um, and so they were great. They assigned him um, professors from each of his courses that would be the liaison for him with his professors. And so therefore, he got to successfully finish his junior year. Um, because of the help that that college and that university gave him. And I think that's what we have to make sure we do. When a, we need to watch for our students' lives. We, we, as a group of trustees, we do pay attention to the student experience, and we want it to be the best that it can be. And 
I think for every student that comes here, if they don't know where to turn, they may not always have that best experience because it's a large university, but they need to know who to turn to. And I think with our Opportunity Scholars, we provide opportunities for them to know exactly who they can get help from. And that makes their lives so much better because they don't have to worry about every move that they make. And um, I think we advise kids well if they use the advising system, but we have to encourage them to make sure that they're getting the right advice and having advisors who are really good. And I know we have some great methods that um, one of our associate provosts has created to uh, make sure that we're giving the right kind of advising to the students here. We really work at that. Um, and again, through this program, it's just an, a, another one of those opportunities where they do get the advice. There's no question about it. And so the chance for success is huge. It's really huge when they get to take this opportunity. Now, uh, one other thing that I noticed uh, in your 2018 interview that you also did with Dr. Ortiz. <laughs> I did. You emphasized the importance of respect towards teachers. So in that time since that interview, do you think that we've improved or uh, what's the status of respect for teachers in society? I think sadly the status of respect in all of society is not where it needs to be. Okay, I think we have to serve as examples. Um, one of the keys to success that I learned through my late husband was to be a role model. And if we use certain behavior, then we demand respect and we command respect, command and demand. Um, and I think that's part of the education that we have to give to people. And in today's world, we have to teach other young people how to be respectful because I don't know that they get it all along in their lives. And so um, it is, is it growing or is it diminishing in terms of how people are? I think there are a lot of people that don't have respect in today's world for others and for lives. Um, and I think it's unfortunate, but again, it's something I believe in teaching and I really want people to understand. And I just can remember sitting down with some young people and explaining certain things to them and helping them to understand the impact of what they do and how they treat people and what it does to those other people. And if they're respectful, they'll get the same treatment back. So I think to me, that's really important. Excellent. Well, Anita, I know you have a very busy schedule and the Proctor program is just very grateful for the time you've spent with us today. Um, are there any uh, thoughts you have on the Opportunity Scholars program that you'd like to, to kind of share as we, as we wrap up? Anything we haven't talked about or touched upon? I think, I feel like you've covered everything, but what I love is what you're doing with this and that you're going to have a video. And I hope I'll have an opportunity to have a copy because I know a lot of people that need to see it. Um, and because of the work that I'm doing right now, um, I love the opportunities I have with college presidents where I live because I am involved at Clemson in Carolina and at the Citadel in Charleston at the College of Charleston. And I'm on the governing board of a two-year college in my community. But the opportunity to create a program like this is just so life altering. And that's what I care about. Just the, the ability to so totally change a life, not change them from love, not loving their parents or thinking differently about what their parents gave them, but understanding what their parents went through to get them as far as they are, and then being able to help their parents while they're helping themselves. I think those opportunities are, are what exist and that make this program so great. And it shows them that they can do so much more with their lives and um, hopefully create family and give them the opportunities that they didn't have as children that they're getting now. And I just feel we're very lucky to have a program like this in this great university. I love University of Florida. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zucker. It's so great to talk with you as, as always. You. Anytime you're in town, please look us up. We're in Pew Hall, I as know. you know. And, um, I do. We also have, you're talking earlier about Holocaust education. So as you probably know, our founder, Sam Proctor, uh, was one of the co-founders of the Jewish Studies program right. uh, at UF. And uh, we have a really 
outstanding collection of interviews with Holocaust survivors. I'm so uh, glad. Yes. So I just participated, um, I don't know, Sunday, 10 days ago maybe, um, I helped Judy Russell with um, her, the 40th anniversary of the Judaica Suite, and I was able to get Dr. Deborah Lipsat to come and be the opening speaker for that event. So she did a 30-minute talk, and then Norman Goda, Dr. Goda. I love um, Norm, yeah. He's great. Yeah. He did a Q&A with her. Nice. And, it, I mean, it was scary, but she was phenomenal. She was just great. And she and I did a Q&A together in Charleston at one point. She came to Charleston about two years ago, and I got to do that with her. And I have a cousin who happens to work with, for her at Emory. And so that's how... I could get to her that way. But I also had met her. She was um, the scholar in residence, the young scholar in residence, when I just started my Jewish community involvement nationally. So um, so I've known her and seen her works through the years, and just amazing. But yeah, we live in a scary world right now, and she made that pretty evident. Exactly. All right, well, thank you again. Yeah.